Good evening. Welcome to Community and Technology, where we connect the global community with news, information, and resources. I'm Stu Reed. Good, my co host, Dave Bernstein. Hey, Dave. Hello. So, what's, what's going exciting on? you this week? Come again? I was asking what's exciting you this week, and I think you were asking what's exciting me this yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, you first, Dave. What's uh, what? let, let me pick up because there's one I wanted to put at the top of the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, the drugs they give people for attention deficit, which is something real, and I'm clinically diagnosed with it, are pretty serious. Mm-hmm. One of them is named dextroamphetamine. Uh, one of them, which basically is the same stuff, but doesn't have such a scary name, is called Ritalin. The reason I'm bringing it here is that a very large study uh, hundreds of thousands of people with electronic health records in Scandinavia discovered that, yes, in fact, the drugs that are used for attention deficit have a serious cardiac problem. Mm. Does that mean you shouldn't take them? That's something for you and your medical practitioner to decide. But I wanted to bring it to the air because this is the first large scale study that said that the amphetamines and amphetamine like drugs that are used for ADHD uh, definitely have cardiac effects that are not huge, not immediate, but important enough you've got to consider it when you consider the drugs. Considering that they handed out almost like candy to children. Really? Yeah. And it certainly does help students pay attention. But I knew speed kills Mm -hmm. back in the day. And the evidence now is that this stuff they're dosing a whole lot of people with uh, is not a gentle drug. Doesn't mean it's the wrong drug. You just mentioned means, this, some of the yeah, stuff that, that they're using on youth that are having difficulty in school. Is that one of the applications of these drugs? That's a massive application of these drugs. Wow. In many schools, if a student acts up in class, teacher says, get him some speed. It's put a little more politely, but that's, that's what it amounts to. Mm-hmm. And it's a very serious decision. And we now have serious evidence that there are long-term health effects. Wow. Wow. So it's not just that's Alzheimer's. Why... That's, that's what I kind of heard when you first talked about it. But it's also for attention deficit disorder, which is... Yeah. Yes. Diagnosed I know what I mean. yeah. Sorry yeah. if I was unclear, but these drugs are mostly used for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, mm. uh, used very heavily in kids and increasingly in adults. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a problem I've got. And I do, in fact, have my mind drifting constantly, and it's an issue. Mm-hmm. I was, uh, because I knew how serious the drugs were, I was scared to take them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I probably should have been taking them much of my much of my life or much of my adult life, but I was scared and never. I still have had half a bottle of them, uh, but they're serious drugs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I guess a, a red flag goes up for me, Dave. Uh, only not only, but you know, one one of the big concerns that I'm aware of is. You know how our school systems are largely failing our kids, and that so many kids, especially black and brown kids, get marginalized and shut aside and and misdiagnosed in my mind as having learning problems and attention deficit disorder being one of them, and being drugged uh, when in fact uh, you know there's some issues with with how the school system is run the curriculum, how the teachers are relating or not relating to the kids, so many other issues that 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 impact how a student performs or doesn't perform in a class. And, you know, my sense is, you know, the, in this culture, the, 
the, the drug uh, remedy just seems like a, a no-brainer and knee-jerk reaction when in fact it is often not the best reaction. And listening to this recent study that came out and the side effects, I mean, that's really scary when you're talking about uh, administering these uh, am amphetamine type drugs to, to young people and, uh, you know, potentially uh, lifelong uh, uh, harm. And let me repeat what I said a moment ago. That doesn't mean you should run away from them. They may very well be right. As I said, most of my adult life, I probably would have been better off if I'd been taking them. Uh, but the evidence is now pretty clear. They are not harmless drugs, and you have to think very carefully about them. Mm -hmm. The evidence is also pretty clear that good schools where the teachers think the students can excel and act on that often can be much more effective for the kids any way you want to measure them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's the better solution. I'm hanging out with all the AI people now. AI people, like almost everybody else, believes that what they're into is going to solve many, many problems. Uh, I remember 1995 or so, interviewing John Scully when he was the president of Apple. And, oh, did he make a fool of himself in that interview. Mm, really? This is 30 years ago. And 30 years ago, he said there's going to be a revolution in education. They're going to use computers. And Apple was the leading computer in most schools. And that's going to transform everything. Mm. Well, 30 years later, have the schools gone in much better? Stu? Not, not by my reckoning. Not, not from what I can see. I have little to no improvement. Uh doesn't mean the schools are nearly as awful as a lot of people think who who spend fifty thousand dollars a year to not send their kids to public schools uh there's a lot of good teachers there there's a lot of good schools they should be much better but the computers have not transformed education mm -hmm. now all the AI people think that they're going to be AI tutors which there will be they will be a useful tool Will they transform education? Absolutely unproven. Yeah, uh, you know, and, you know, fr from my lens, Dave, looking back, you and I have been around for a minute. We have seen uh, so many technologies come and go that had uh, an incredible promise to transform the world. Uh, in, in my mind, it's people that are the real issue. It's not, it's not the tools. It's people. And until people in our consciousness evolve to the point where we are more, more, more caring and, and more concerned about each other than we are about uh, money and, and the whole capitalist uh, uh, mentality that seems to be driving the globe, until that gets adjusted and, and reframed, uh, you know, I don't see the technology is going to have an impact on really changing things. It's, it's going to have an impact. It almost definitely is not going to have nearly the impact the advocates think. Mm -hmm. It just isn't that simple to change people. Yeah. And it's not just capitalism. Once upon a time, there was the new Soviet man. And we certainly know the Chinese have tried to create a different feeling. And so have the Christians, the true Christians. Mm -hmm. The early Christians were very open about this. I'm reading a book about the uh, New Roman Empire, when the Roman Empire left Rome and went to Constantinople, now Istanbul, mm -hmm. starting in uh, 325. And the author, and it's a brilliant book, it really has reframed all the history of that period, uh, talks about how, no, the... Yes, in 325, Constantinople was formed, and the Empire, Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman state. Did Christianity take over? He's arguing that the exact opposite happened. That 
the Roman style took over Christianity. That mm. when you look to the early church fathers and the Bible itself, they talk about Christianity as a new state, a new people, a commonality across nations. And very much early Christianity was a communal religion, very much not a religion of emperors yeah. and nations. Yeah. Well, I'm sure I'm sure Dan, you read about, and, and know about the Council of Nicaea. I think that was right around the same time that you're talking about. Yep. And I think that's when the, the 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 political forces came in and took over the religion we know as Christianity and decided to regiment it and use it as a political tool. I mean, that's that's my reading of what happened historically. They threw out a lot of the texts that, that you're talking about that were that were more uh I, I guess uh uh advocating more more openness and more uh, self-seeking as opposed to the didactic teaching. And uh, uh, really the, the religion in my mind became politicized at that point and became, became a political uh, machine. At least that was the undertone of it. Uh, did, did you, do you agree with any of that? What's your reading on that? The last thing I'm qualified to talk about is early is, is Christian religion. Look at the things I'm Jewish and I'm not particularly religious. But it's very impressive looking at the ideals expressed by Jesus in the Bible mm -hmm. and expressed by his early followers and be enthused. Of, I think we're going to be talking later in the show about a remarkable new video tool. It comes from OpenAI. It's called Sora. Uh, and it's really good. And as I was thinking of it and reading this, I said, hmm, now I have a tool that would let me make video. Would it, should I take actual words in the Bible of Jesus that poses something that's very different than what's happening in most of the Christian countries I know. Uh, and very much, remember, uh, think on your Bible. How easy it is for a rich man to get into heaven. Um, you know, I, I'm not a Bible scholar, uh, Dave. I, I couldn't I couldn't quote. Uh, I thought you'd know you this one, because it's just so perfect. It's harder than for a camel to get through the head of a needle. Yes, I, I do recall that now that you say that. Mm -hmm. but yeah. And very much the religion of Jesus is about caring for the poor mm -hmm. and caring for the community mm -hmm. and beating swords into plowshares. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Dave, I, I don't want—I don't want to devolve into uh, a bashing of uh, the evolution of Christianity because because we could go on and on. And this is a technology show, not not a religious. Okay. <laughs> and the technology bit is the technology that's there now. The video technology allows you and me to make a surprisingly attractive short video of anything, mm -hmm. whether it be our opinion of early Christianity, or the better way to do education. Mm -hmm. That's another. Let's go back to the medical thing, because I like to, when I see something that matters for people in medicine, I like to bring it to the end. Okay, go. Huge study. Data from almost 100 million people mm. who got vaccinated against COVID. Mm -hmm. Definitely there are side effects. The study showed a small increase in the rate of heart inflammation. Mm. Is that another guest coming in? Yes, Did we I have. I think uh, Jenny Bourne is, uh, is about to join us, uh, Dave. So let me wrap up what I was just saying and okay. introduce Jenny because that's she's the video person in the family. 
Uh, there definitely is increase in heart inflammation. There apparently is an increase in Godbar syndrome. Does this mean that you should avoid vaccination from COVID? My personal opinion is I'm going to take every vaccine I can get. And I think nine out of 10 doctors agree with me. But anybody who says that there are no side effects of the vaccine doesn't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. The vaccine is designed the way vaccines work is it turns on your immune system and that has consequences. Everything I know says the consequences are much less than the consequences of getting COVID and that the vaccine is still absolutely worthwhile, but that doesn't mean there are no consequences and it doesn't mean you shouldn't make an intelligent decision mm -hmm. for yourself. And what what were the side effects in that study, Dave, that, that you're referencing? What what was what side effects were they talking about? The two that were there in small numbers were heart inflammation, myocarditis, mm -hmm. and guide bar syndrome, whose details I don't quite remember. Uh, it's an immune failure that gives you muscle problems and so mm -hmm. on. I see. Did it happen to many people? No. It happened to so many that I would be uncomfortable taking the vaccine? No. Is it significant enough that, is this new news? No. From the beginning, they said there were some side effects, but they were rare. Uh, but it's absolute confirmation that there are some side effects, that there's some crackpots there making claims that are not scientifically supported about how common and serious the side effects are. Mm -hmm. But anybody who says there are no side effects possible, go get another opinion from somebody else, even if that fellow is, or woman is a doctor you respect, because the, the evidence is very strong that there's side effects. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take myself a piece of sunshine And paint it all over my sky yeah. Be no rain Be no rain I'm gonna take the song from every bird And make them sing it just for me something to teach us all about being free yeah. be no rain be no rain and I think I'll call it morning from now on Myself, I've got to be alone. Why should I subscribe to this world's madness? Knowing that I've got to live on. Take myself a piece of sunshine and paint it all over my sky. Yeah. Be no rain.
This is WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. You're listening to Community and Technology with Stu Reed and Dave Burstein. Okay, we are, we're, we're back and we now have a new guest that I'm going to let uh, Dave introduce. Dave, please introduce our, our special guest. Jenny Bourne is a remarkable woman I've known for many years, and been close to for many years, who, among other things, has a degree in film from NYU, has worked with people like Spike Lee, makes a lot of videos, and definitely is the expert here on what video is like. That's why I asked her to join the show. OpenAI has introduced Sora. It's a new generator text to video that to my eye looks Darn good. Looks like it, it looks like something that was shot with a top digital camera or perhaps on film, to my eye. That's a breakthrough. There's been a lot of stuff happening in video and AI, but the quality hasn't been there. Jenny, what did you think when you looked at the examples of Sora? Oh, the examples are gorgeous. Uh, they always are. But we have to keep in mind that um, each sample is only a few seconds, and it takes an incredible amount of computing power to create them. And that uh, these uh, examples are created to impress us, and, and they do. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're working tools for the video industry right now. Um, it's a glimpse into the future, and it has the potential to replace some of the more tedious uh, steps in um, dealing with video production. But it's not the answer. Um, it doesn't replace um, all video production. We see a large amount of um, low quality video production today um, on YouTube and TikTok. No matter how fancy your camera is, no matter how uh, good your intentions are, um, there has to be skill behind producing video that communicates effectively. It appears through these examples that the computers have this skill. But in fact, the computers are dependent on human beings making the right kinds of prompts which is the question you ask the computer, the information that you give the computer before um, it generates uh, these still and video images. And so the upcoming skill has um, shaken out as uh, who can deliver the most effective prompts to get the best results. Um, making a whole um, five, a minute video or a feature film is a long way off with these technologies, but it's interesting to take a look at them um, as we move uh, into the future. One caution is that um, they do create a potential for deep fakes, and we've seen that in the news recently. Um, uh, uh, videographers uh, imitating a Biden and um, others have created videos that are convincing enough that one New York Times uh, writer said that um, her, her mother didn't uh, recognize when a voice called and appeared to be her and, and wasn't. 
So um, we, I understand there was a, a conference at um, Columbia this week in which security was discussed. And that's a really, really important step as we step into a future that's very uncertain in terms of what's reality and what's not. It was so good that, yes, a news reporter was able to fool her own mother with the quality of speech. And we talked about on this show a week or two ago how a scam artist convinced a financial officer of a major company to move $23 million to some bank accounts by creating a fake Zoom identity that looked like the CFO of that same company. It's getting so good. Robert Rush in the Times pointed out that see, seeing will no longer be believing or no longer should be believing is the fakes are getting so good. But the interesting thing he said is that believing is seeing. Noting how somebody's belief is totally influencing how they're seeing reality. Mm -hmm. The example he gave was totally different responses to what's happening in the economy, better than whether you were a Republican or a Democrat today. The econ how the economy is doing is a fairly objective thing. We know what the unemployment rate is. We know what the gross national product growth is. We know what productivity growth is. But depending on your opinion, political opinion, your rating on how the economy was doing was totally different. Mm -hmm. It's well, becoming. I, you know, uh, all of these technologies bring up a need for literacy. And what's happening in our schools today is really frightening. Um, but now we don't just need to teach our. Uh, children to read and write and do uh, arithmetic uh, effective enough to balance their checkbooks, um, we need to have them challenge what they see. Advertising has always lied. Statistics have always lied. It's up to us to be more critical of the information that we're receiving. And one thing uh, I think it's important to notice is that most of us are receiving large, large volumes of information through screens each day. Receiving such a large volume of information desensitizes us to the quality of the information. We, we don't look at it in a challenging way because we assume that because we're receiving a large volume, we can sort out the information that we're receiving. But we need to understand that many of these media outlets are owned by the same companies behind the scenes. And it's easy to manipulate the public's gaze. So challenging ourselves to take time away from screens and talk to each other and to become members of organizations that have valuable sources of information that we can trust is very, very important because um, since these media are no longer trustworthy, and, and the news hasn't been trustworthy for a very long time, we know that. Um, uh, Julian uh, Assange is uh, uh, awaiting extradition in, in uh, London as, as we speak because he sought to break the the bubble of the illusion that we were getting full information in this this country about um, what's happening around the world and our government's role in it. So um, it, it is challenging uh, not to sit around and be dazzled by technology, but to take responsibility for um, challenging the kind of information that we receive through it. and initiating dialogues um, um, in our families, in our churches, in our interest groups, and, and uh, among friends uh, to, to decide and understand better what's real. 
Jenny, have you seen any curriculum models or any educational approaches that begin to talk about exactly what you're saying, being critical of media, being critical of all the information overload that we have, teaching folks how to how to look at stuff and how to decipher stuff? Uh, is that entering even entering into the discussion in education from what you said? I, I'm sure it is. I haven't been following education, so I can't say whether it is or it is not. It's not center stage, though. Uh, schools are in so much trouble trying to deliver the basic education and being challenged by um, uh, the corporate structure that is now funding um, charter schools and negligence on the part of our, our cities and states in, in terms of um, allowing um, churches and other independent organizations to create their own curriculums for our children's education. So um, it, I, I think it's safe to say that they have bigger problems uh, right now. Mm -hmm. And so they're really not focused on this. But to our detriment, these machines are getting smarter fast. And uh, if we don't want to be, you know, the minions on the factory floor supporting them, we're going to have to up the intelligence and the, the uh, critical analysis of the information that we're receiving. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what, what would you say to, to mothers and fathers of, of school age kids uh, to help guide them in talking to their kids about these issues? How, how do we bring it into our homes and, and, and help our kids start to address this? Uh, limit your own viewing first, as an example, and then limit your children's viewing. Encourage them to read. Talk to each other as a start. Mm -hmm. Because until we do those things, the major information these kids are getting is from the media is from the internet, is from social media. And we know how distorted that information can be. But just as a starting point, turn off phones during the dinner hour. You know, turn off, have your children turn off their phones uh, when they come in from school, sit down and talk to them. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and start to have meaningful dialogues. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's interesting. Uh, uh, the the three of us are a little older, and I know when we were coming up, it was turn off the TV, because that mm -hmm. was the media that was uh, being so intrusive and still is, uh, in many ways, mm -hmm. controlling our our lives and our, our mentality and our thinking about the world. But the technology has evolved, and now it is the phones. It is that that computer in the pocket, if you will that is so much more invasive than the TV was. Uh, it's interactive. Uh, you know, so many other folks are able to get on the platform and manipulate. But as you said, and I, I certainly agree with you, Jenny, that so much of, of what is on the internet and what we see is still behind the scenes, manipulated by the powerful corporate forces that are working to keep the world organized as, as it is. This is WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. You're listening to Community and Technology with Stu Reed and Dave Burstein. I mean, you can, you can try an experiment with your, yourself. You can decide that you won't look at your phone when you're in elevators or you won't look at your phone when you're on mass transit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, turn to the person next to you and you know how to gauge whether they're receptive or not, you know, and make a comment. Start a, start a discussion you'll be very surprised how much you have in common with the people around you. But if we're all staring into the small screen in the palm of our hands, it really limits that connection. Mm -hmm. Let wow. me come in here to finish the story about Sora because it is really incredible. It shows you that the capacity to make good looking video is there. It's not available to the public, and it won't be for a while to make it available in a very limited number of chosen people. It has a lot of technical problems, so it looks great. 
if you weren't a professional video person like Jenny, and I've learned a lot from Jenny on this kind of stuff, you'd think it was good enough to make a real movie with. It's not there yet. Although in the hands of people who know how to make a real movie, it's going to be a valuable tool maybe in six months, certainly in less than six years. It has a lot of problems so far. We have very limited information because OpenAI is trying to make a trillion dollars. Uh, and just like a few other big giant internet companies in California. They let me just interrupt you a minute to, to say that uh, OpenAI is trying to uh, make a trillion dollars based on information they've collected from us, data they've collected from us. Um, you know, when when uh, I logged on to this call, it said, remember, uh, we have cookies working in the background. We know who you are. We know where you are. We know what you're talking about. And, um, and so um, having some kind of legislative control over these technologies is going to be very important because there's no large language model that is not based on information that was legally and illegally collected from all of us. So this is our data. This is, this is the, the pictures that you posted online on Facebook and on YouTube and uh, in your emails um, gathered up and used to make money for another entity. So we, we really need to think seriously about this. All of which are things that there's lots to talk about, but just getting back to the technology on Sora, beside the fact that it's closed, there's some important ways it doesn't work. It can, unlike most of the video modeling, produce multiple moving objects in the picture. It could generate a hockey game. Unfortunately, so far it doesn't get the physics right. And people wind up on top of each other and things like that. So the perspective to take away from this is all the things that Stu and Jenny have been saying about how we have to think about what this does to the world and our perception. But also on the technical side, to know that it looks really good most of the time. There's still a lot of big problems to solve. Mm -hmm. It's and a I very, think, very young right technology. Yeah, Jenny, it's I, a very young technology. I, yeah, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, as you were describing how this technology, the Soros technology works, you were saying that you have to prompt it and that the, mm -hmm. the real uh, magic of what you get is how you prompt it. What, exactly what does that mean? Can you kind of walk us through an example? Well, when you okay. go into any of these large language models, Dave can explain it a little better than I can. Um, you, you start with a, a question and how effectively you pose that question and what you're asking for from the language model, mm -hmm. it, just like when you go into Google, just like when you do a Boolean search on the library site, what you get depends on how you form the question. And you do have the opportunity to refine the question if you don't like uh, the results, but this takes time and it takes energy and it takes computing power. So people are working hard to develop the skill to do effective prompting. Mm -hmm. Jenny, I think you saw the example Sora put out there of a stylish woman walking down a Tokyo street. I have the prompt here. But what did you think about the video that you saw? It was so really enticing and, and interesting. It had pretty uh, lighting. She had on interesting clothes and, and, and sunglasses. Um, and I'm sure that uh, listeners can uh, tune in if we place the right links to see it for themselves. But so what? I mean, it, 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 it's very nice. We can create images that can seduce. Uh, what we're talking about is not to create fantasies or illusions for, for people, but how effectively these technologies might be 
utilized in spreading information or something that's true and how we make a distinction between the two. And it's necessary to make a distinction between the two or else you end up buying stuff that is not what you expect it to be. You, you, you end up um, uh, making sacrifices that are necessary to make in your life because the results are not going to be what you expect them to be. So, so that type of seduction, while well, we can enjoy, it's like pornography, we can enjoy it, but um, we need to ask, what's the cost? So let me get back to what Stu had just asked and what you were talking about there. The prompt for that, which gave us a Tokyo street with all the flesh and lights that you dream of the Ginza of producing, was a stylish woman walks down a Tokyo street filled with warm, glowing neon and animated city signage. She wears a black leather jacket, a long red dress, black boots and carries a black purse. She wears sunglasses and red lipstick. She walks confidently and casually. The street is damp and reflective, creating a mirror effect of the colored lights. Many pedestrians walk about. That's the answer to what's the prompt? I bet it took oh dozen tries and maybe a day's work or several days work before they got it just right. That's a skill. Prompt engineering is becoming a profession at the moment. Uh, it's not trivial to get it right, but it certainly is going to be one heck of a tool. And frankly, this lady in this scene looks good. Stu, do we have time before the break, or is it time to call for a break? Uh, you know, I, I think we had our break when Jenny came on, so we, we really only have about five minutes of runtime left. So why why don't we just uh, carry on for another five minutes, and then we'll say goodnight. Okay. Let me go to another story about artificial intelligence, which, incidentally, a, a respected researcher yesterday yesterday at a Columbia event got dead wrong. The researcher said, oh, but the problem is when it's not in English, they don't have it. Well, that the language models that are in English aren't there yet. That wasn't, that's paraphrasing. Well, one of the stories I wanted to bring to the air is Aya. Aya from Cohere AI uh, just got released two or three days ago. What can it do? Well, it's an open source, massively multilingual, large language model, and the data set created for it to help support underrepresented languages. It supports more than 101 different languages. Hmm. Now, when you, when you say supports, what does that mean, Dave, supports those languages? It means you can give your prompts and get your answer in any hmm. one of those languages. Wow. It still is probably going to be better in English because there's way more data in English on the mm -hmm. way to start on. Actually, the person at that symposium that I watched online uh, was saying that uh, the Chinese don't have it. That actually is a mistake, check, or just out of date. Six months ago, she was probably going to be right, this distinguished professor. But in the last two or three months, some, some really big Chinese language models have come out there that are comparable to the best that we have in English. Shall I run down a few of uh, some of the news stories that we didn't get to? Yeah, just before you leave, what was the name? I, I couldn't quite understand. What was the name of that, that model you just talked about? The support oh, yeah. AYA comes from Cohere. And what's special about it is that it works with 101 mm -hmm. different languages. And it works quite well with most of them, probably, mm -hmm. based on what I know of the of the people who made it. I haven't had a chance to play with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, news stories about what's going. 
NASA is looking for people to test out its Mars simulator. What? Yeah, what? Yeah. <laughs> Say that again, Dave? <laughs> going to Mars, it's going to take a long time, a year or so, mm -hmm. if, at, at, at what it looks like the, the mission is going to be just to get there. You're going to be in a small spacecraft. So they're looking for volunteers to spend a year closed into what a model of a small spacecraft oh, wow. would be. Yes. The size of a large and maybe studio. not and maybe not come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, not this sounds, this sounds like the Twilight Zone, but the, the very first Twilight Zone episode, I'm old enough to remember, was about a guy you didn't know it until the end of the episode. But he was in, in a simulator, simulating a trip in outer space, and he had all these crazy fantasies, hallucinations, if you will, as to what was going on. And at the end of the episode, oh, he was in a in a simulator, in a capsule, simulating a trip to outer space. Wow. Mm -hmm, in the warehouse somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Jenny. You remember the one. That's the one. Exactly. Mm -hmm, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next story. Uh Alabama's Supreme Court has ruled fo frozen embryos are children and need to be protected. Now, wait, wait. Frozen embryos of, 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 of humans? Children. They're, they're children and need to be protected. Wow. Right. Uh, and a lot of women are freezing their embryos because, as we know, the older you get, less viable the embryos are going to be uh and some women want to now, get this around is, this is embryos these are fertilized eggs as as yes. opposed to uh eggs or and that could be combined later with sperm yes I, I i uh i stand corrected and one of the problems with this is the way they do in vitro uh fertilization routinely, which is resulting in millions and millions of pregnancies for people, families who haven't been able to have a pregnancy. It's difficult, it's apparently painful, it's expensive, but sometimes it works, is that they give you drugs to produce multiples, and then they choose one or two or three to re-implant and grow, well, I don't know what's going to be involved here when they're saying that that might get you uh, arrested and jailed for murder mm. if you don't properly take care of the other embryos that are produced in the ordinary course of in vitro. Wow. That's one of the bits. Wow. Uh, next, the billion-dollar court verdict against Cox, a big cable company, mostly in the South, has been set aside on appeal. Cox is saying this is great that they want to be able to give broadband without getting a billion dollar judgment against them for what their users may or may not be doing. That's illegal. Mm -hmm. It's going to go back to court, however. It's been set aside and we sent, sent back to the court. What the law is going to be about copyright and the responsibilities? Well, Time Warner is threatening people to cut them off at, still. So we'll see how that plays that, that, That's a big issue, Dave, that, you know, I know we've kind of danced around before in terms of the First Amendment rights of some of these platforms and and, and, where, and, and who's liable. Uh, but, Dave, we're about out of time here. Where is it? Can you give me one last story? Okay. Go ahead. The news? They're not fake diamonds. They're making real diamonds with high pressure and high temperatures, and that's exploding, especially being produced in India and in China. And a news story says that last year, 17% of the diamond engagement rings in the U.S. had real diamonds that were manufactured, not mined. And by one analyst thinks it's now up to 36%. Wow. They are real diamonds. They're compressing just as pressure under the earth and temperature creates diamonds. You can do that now in the laboratory. And apparently 36% of 
of all engagements and wedding rings are being made that way. Laboratory produced as opposed to mined diamonds. And the price, of course, has come all the way down. One carat is floating at about a thousand dollars, and two carats at two or three thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Wow. Two carat diamond ring is pretty big. Jenny, mm-hmm. are you still with us? No, we yeah, don't have no comment. Yes, yes, yes. No, no <laughs> comment. You know, uh, what, what's, 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 what's real and what's fake? You know, uh, I, I, I think our, our parents and our grandparents would have something to, to say about, about these issues. It's, it's, you know, uh, if, 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 a, if a big piece of glass on your finger makes you happy, uh, uh, by all means, go out and get one and uh, impress your other friends that are, are impressed by that. I, I, it feels like the world's going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, fake, fake bodies, you know, mm-hmm. uh, above and below, you know. On uh, the head, the kids are made in the laboratory. Oh my goodness! I, I, I this makes me feel really old. <laughs> okay, well, we're gonna have to wind up right there with that. Uh, we've been talking with uh, Jenny Bourne, filmmaker, uh, videographer extraordinaire. Jenny, I want to thank you for coming to the show today. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Talk to you again soon. Okay, so for Dave Bernstein, Dave, thank you, Dave. And Stewie. Uh, it's is... really good to have Jenny on the air. Oh, yeah, it's Jenny, you got, you got to come back again yeah. soon. Uh, very fresh insights into these issues that are going to be with us for some time. So thank you to our listening thank audience. You. This has been uh, Community and Technology on WACR 90.3 FM, The Voice of Harlem, every Wednesday, 5 p.m. Tune in. Just might learn something. Good night.